Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to the American Studies channel at the New Books Network. My name is Brittany Edmonds and I'm very happy to be speaking with Dr. Jed Esty about his newest book, The Future of Decline, Anglo-American Culture at Its Limits. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Esty. Thank you, Brittany. Really glad to be here with you. Yeah. So I wanted to start by asking some questions just about the title. Um, And so I wonder if you could tell us a bit about decline and declinism, which is a term you often use in your book, and then also tell us a bit about um, why you've chosen to sort of delimit your study around Anglo-American culture and say a bit about how you might define that. Well, I mean, the the simplest way to think about that Anglo-American hyphenate in, in the title is that I wanted to write a book about a, a kind of double-sided story about power and its aftermath. And, you know, one could say that Britain was the dominant global economic power from 1820 to 1920, <clears throat> and that America took over that mantle and was the dominant power from 1920 to 2020. And what is epical, what is game-changing about where you and I are living right now is that we're living in the transitional decade where the U S won't be the number one power by the time we hit 2030 in economic terms, it's pretty much inevitable now that China is going to take that spot. And, you know, the, the question is twofold one, what are the opportunities and freedoms as opposed to just the losses associated with becoming number two, what does it mean to be number two? And, and then the second question is the historical one, which is what did it mean to Britain? And how did it change British society and British culture? And that, that's what drove the, the kind of double approach of the book. And that's why I want to kind of use the past of British decline to try to speak about the future of American decline. Okay. Um, so when you when you say Anglo American culture at its limits, you're not that doesn't map on to how we might understand, we'll say like popular culture or mass culture or racial identity or you know, all the things that sort of Anglo-American culture generally maps onto. Because I, and I asked this question just because there were times in your book where I was, I was curious about what you would say about current shifts. And we're going to get into this, I imagine, later in the interview, current demographic shifts, which are underway right now in this country in terms of how people define themselves politically, um, et cetera. I mean, we, I could name a list of things that sort of disrupt that as a formulation to describe racial populations, for example. Yeah, right. Well, that's right. Well, so the semantic confusion in the word or the term Anglo-American as a hyphen term could be that it refers to a certain stripe of English speaking Euro-American heritage, people, culture, racial identity even. And you're right. I do mean to, to in effect, uh, describe a different thing with the term Anglo-American, which is British culture or specifically English culture in the United Kingdom and American culture. But the, you know, the secret signifier there is the one that you've already begun to point to, which is that this is a story about moral panic among white Americans, and that the the language of national decline, like its predecessor, the language of national supremacy, are actually, I think, covertly and and, in a coded way, languages that are about whiteness, that are increasingly in our in our current times about a problem of white panic because of demographic shift on the inside of the country and power shift on the outside of the country. Yeah, I imagine I want us to kind of lay out some of the arguments um, in your book, just so, so listeners have more to sort of grab onto. Uh, but we're definitely going to going to circle back to, to, you know, your descriptions of moral panic, of Trumpism, of sort of declinism as being a kind of phenomenon that presents predominantly in or that is most sort of discernible uh, amongst the populace and sort of uh, white or right-leaning reactionary behaviors. I was very curious about a lot of that discussion in your book, so we're going to return there. Um, But I wanted to just lay out some more definitions. So why is decline, like what is declinism? Um, Why is it so attractive to people at sort of all levels of society, right? All kinds of political actors, all kinds of cultural actors, all kinds of intellectual commentators. And does declinism itself, that sort of ideology, that way, that mode of discourse as a way of thinking about the U.S. right now, does it have a particular uh, political character? Yeah, great questions. And, And it circles back to the very first thing you wanted me to address, which is what's decline and what's declinism. And, you know, the first half of that question, decline is the kind of 
let's say, the economic and material conditions, the, the bottom line, the ground for this conversation, which is about narratives and about mythologies and about symbols and the languages we use to describe American life and American culture. Um, but to Kleinism, you know, I, right away I have to jump in and say I think there are three distinct periods of American declinism. That is, broadly speaking, a belief in or a rhetoric of loss, that America in the past was somehow better or greater than America in the present. Now, that declinism, as any sp- student of American letters or American culture knows, has been with us for centuries. And it takes different guises and different subcultures of American life. But one mainstream version of it, you know, started out with the Pilgrims and the Puritans and and had to do with a kind of moral degeneration of the society. In my own lifetime, and this is kind of what motivates the book autobiographically, that narrative of moral decline got powerfully fused to a narrative of political, social, and economic decline starting in the 1970s, I think. And that's a, a new layer, a new stripe got added to it, a powerful pre-existing mythology of loss and decline. And from Vietnam and Watergate forward, for people of my generation, um, uh, you know, the, the sense that America was dwindling in its capacity to be a strong society or a good society was very powerful. And now, to get to the third station in this itinerary, I think we're at a real crisis point, a real inflection point. And for so many of us, it's been a, it's been a dark and difficult and challenging, you know, two months, two years, even decade. But I also think, and this is the, I think the motivation behind the book is that it's a very transformative time. The sense that declinism is now materially fused to decline, that we really are becoming a, a, a number two country in the world, means that we can let go of certain kinds of mythic attachments to greatness because we have to, because the world tells us that we have to. And that begins to I think disrupt some of the wiring that connects white supremacy to American supremacy that connects the language of national greatness to the language of lost greatness and, and to the, and, you know, finally to the specifically rightward leaning rhetoric of make America great again. You know, one last point in answer to this broad set of definitional questions. I mean, for me, the essence of the problem is, as long as people on the left and center are still secretly wedded to the idea of American greatness. And a lot of them are. And Obama and Biden both were and are. As long as they are, they're replicating a kind of problem, uh, a reflex problem of thinking about America in terms of greatness and not in terms of goodness. Well, I'm curious if you could say a bit more about um, that sort of first, you said there are three sort of ways that declinism is inflected in your book. I wonder if you could say a bit more about that first, just the belief in loss or the rhetoric of loss uh, that you said is sort of, we see as early as the pilgrims. I'm just, I just, that, that was curious to me. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Well, in a lot of, a lot of Puritan uh, writing has to do with the idea that as soon as these small settlements were formed, you know, in the New England wilderness and the Mid-Atlantic wilderness, the ideal of religious devotion that motivated them, or religious purity that motivated the, the transmigration of that group of white Europeans, white British folk to this continent, you know, was already under corruption. And that as soon as settlements grow and the economy complexifies and encounters with indigenous people happen, you know, that the, the kind of pure community ideal, the city on a hill, the famous phrase, shining city on a hill starts to fall away. And, um, that strong Puritan anchor to the rhetoric of American national decline, I think, has always been in place. And of course, its obverse side, right, is manifest destiny, the idea that America is always getting bigger and better. And to me, the secret lock that I wanted to try to pick in this very short book is the link between those two sides, which is the social divisions around class, race, gender, indigeneity, sexuality, and so on, that produce conflict, strife, social antagonism, competition for resources and recognition, right? Those things, America's manifest destiny rhetoric produced a pattern whereby instead of solving and confronting those problems, we simply tried to grow away from them, to outgrow them. And this is why one of the keynote figures in the book, 
is Reinhold Niebuhr, the mid-century theologian who, who Obama was fond of citing, you know, who, who said very powerfully back in the 1950s, we have intense, vexatious problems of social justice that we aren't solving because we just keep pushing the frontier out and growing the economy and hoping that a bigger pie will mean that we don't ever have to solve those problems. Well, I believe that what we're living through now is the time when that bill has come due, when the frontier can't be pushed any further, when the economy can't be grown across, against the limits of climate change and the rise of the rest of the world around us geopolitically. America has hit a limit, and that's what the cult culture at its limit means in my title. And it means that those vexatious problems of social justice now do have to be solved. And I think that's what we're witnessing. Yeah, I mean, this is where, where your book starts to get really interesting and, and, and the arguments get really, really complicated. Um, and so I wonder if we could we could talk a bit about sort of, okay, you argue that um, declinism, decline is inevitable, right? Um, and you just give that really great um, kind of summary of everything about declinism now sort of long this is long-standing rhetoric in the u.s but it's now materially fused to actual economic decline in the sense that the u.s won't be you know just the sort of superpower uh, economically in the world that it once was but you also argue in your book that you know likely there will never be a country that assumes that kind of position again or at least not in our lifetime so for the purposes of this conversation and so i wonder if you could talk about kind of what that means even as we talk about american decline because even in your book you kind of say well yes the u.s will be sort of number two maybe eventually it'll fall to number three even behind india but you know, there's still all these other things, right? Like it's military or, um, or, or just, 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 it's, it's sort of, uh, it's longstanding role as sort of being supreme, still leaving an imprint. And you, you talk about this a great deal in your book. And so I just wonder if you could maybe talk about what that means for even being number two, because it seems like it's being number two won't be like the UK's number two. And we're going to get into your comparison of those two countries, but yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's right. And there's, and you point to a lot of the key factors already. That's a great question. I mean, it, in terms of culture, language, and technology, even if we leave aside our immense wealth per capita and our military and strategic dominance in the world, which are neither of which are going to go away uh, anytime soon, anytime on the horizon, um, even in the soft power realm of culture, technology, and language, English and and English dominated technologies digital technologies, and, and cultural technologies, those forms of soft power, America is going to still have a much more dominant role than China, even when it's number two or number three. Um, and that's, you know, history is very sticky. Power, power formations, the formations of colonialism, of racial capitalism, of settlement that, that started off in cycles in the 15, 16, 1700s, they're still very powerful in shaping our world today. And that's part of the driving thesis of the book, which is there's, a, there's an inconsistency almost to the point of a um, radical blind spot in the way that mainstream public discourse in America about decline operates. And that blind spot is the joint feeding to the people who read and think about American issues of, of a nonsensical formulation, which is both that we're about to fall off a cliff and become a second rate country and that we never have to think about being number two. And somehow those messages are fully, fully contradictory of each other and yet everywhere present in our culture. And, you know, that, that's the thing I wanted to really put the finger on in this book and really try to um, take the measure of in the book, which is how did this discourse become so popular while being so contradictory and whose interests does it serve? Um, and, it's a very delicate balancing act because on the one hand, what I'm trying to argue is Americans shouldn't catastrophize or panic about our changing geopolitical and geoeconomic role because that panic actually feeds Trumpism. It feeds MAGA discourse and it feeds the rightward drift of our political culture. And so what I say with the British comparison in part is, look, this is a tiny country that's still incredibly well endowed and powerful for its size because of its history, Britain. And America being much more powerful territorially, demographically, and in terms of you know, industrial and post-industrial economic power, it's not going to suddenly shrink. Nothing catastrophic is going to happen. But on the other hand, it's real and it's true 
that we can't continue to reproduce the mythology, that we're the freest country, that we're the best country, and we certainly aren't going to be the biggest economy anymore. So maybe the point now for us is to try to see into the under the hood and into the wiring of how it became kind of the central fact of American life that we're the number one country in the world and to see the possibilities for change when we start thinking in other terms than growth and power will save us from the social problems we face. Yeah, you know, something that I struggled with sometime, uh, like while reading your book was just like, okay, well, there is there is the reality that that America was once a kind of, it was a kind of global superpower in a very kind of unique way, right? And so it was kind of very easy to make an empirical claim that it's the number one country in the world, even if that's not true across every indice that you could measure it by. Um, and so, so that sometimes ran me into problems, but then I also like, even just now, like hearing you formulate, okay, well the declinism, I mean, you go into this in, in, in detail in your book, you know, the sort of declinism, the rhetoric, basically it sort of struggles with the inevitability of decline while also sort of refusing to think about us being number two. But, you know, as we kind of said right before that, I mean, a part of that struggle is the fact that like, well, like even in decline, it'll be hard for us to really understand ourselves as number two, given how long the U S dominated, given the uniqueness of its domination, sort of, et cetera. And then just as a kind of addendum to all that, which I've just said, you know, as you just said, sort of thinking about the country having this sort of change status, you know, what I was thinking about in the book is still like, you know, people vote with their feet, which is often a, a kind of right wing, um, gosh, talking point. But it's true, right? Like people do come to this country and just just outsize number still. And often, you know, these are people of color even. Um, and so I, I wonder what you would make of that when we I wonder what you would make of that alongside, you know, this sort of idea that rhetoric about the country being number one or about being a kind of desirable place to live or even an extremely desirable place to live is somehow only bound up or often it's often bound up with narratives of white supremacy but i i wonder about just sort of locating like only locating it within that sort of space well that is exactly the core idea right is to try to hold on to what's powerful and attractive about american society that may has made it a powerful attractor for people from all over the world, um, and people of all kinds, religions, races, backgrounds, geographies, and to separate that from the kind of supremacist or superiorist rhetoric, which is to say the goodness of American society and the promise of its particular commitments to freedom, which have been so radically compromised in the last month by you know the social divisions around gun control and reproductive choice, um, you know, there, there's still powerful sources of potential shared and cohesive national purpose. There's a, there's a way I think to re knit our society around those values. And the distinct, the thing you're pointing to is what's the big deal if we're technically number two, we're still going to act like we're number one. We're still going to have all these forms of cultural infrastructure that suggest we're number one, and we're still going to be the number one absorbing net immigration positive country in the world. You know, it's not like everyone's going to be moving to China and India now. They're not. So, I mean, you're right about all those things, and that's a really important challenge to the book. But I really think that when you peel away the rhetoric of superiority, of, of the idea that we have to be the best in the world, and that we have to keep preening ourselves on being the freest in the world... When objective indices, leave alone economics, just political indices of freedom, such as the corruption index or, you know, infant mortality or, you know, any kind of health and political index you look at now, climate indexes, we fall to 10th, 20th, 30th, 50th, you know, on a lot of these measures. And it's, it, it becomes more and more obvious that being the greatest country was a kind of co cohesion myth that we not only don't need anymore, but we can't sustain anymore. And so... You know, the idea isn't we're going to suddenly drastically change our self-image. It's, it's more like this. And this is where the British example becomes key. In that moment of peak power, the 1950s, was there a white mythology? Was there a national mythology of goodness, of decency, of democracy and freedom? Absolutely. Was it partially a lie? Absolutely. Did it persuade more people in and outside the country of its truth than it does now? I think so. Was it linked to massive global dominance of the industrial 
world and the economic and trade world. Yes. Neither of those things is quite true anymore. That is, the power of the myth isn't as true as it was, and the power of the economy isn't as true as it was. And what the British case shows us is that when Britain was going through similar paroxysms and transformative architectonic changes in its power structure, at a certain point, and this is something I get from Stuart Hall and associated historians of British culture, the British public had to be sold on the idea that they were an imperial and conquering country, that it was their destiny to rule others. And at a certain point, Stuart Hall argues, if they can be sold on that idea, and they actually were through popular culture and political rhetoric, they can be sold on another idea. And that's really the thing I'm saying in response to your question is, Americans after 1950 were increasingly told, what does America mean? It means being the top country in the world. But before that, and underneath that and outside that, we can say America means a lot of other things, much better things than just, it's our job to rule the world. It's not our job. And in a multipolar world, even if China doesn't become a dominant superpower, in a multipolar world of the next 30 years, Americans have to learn how to think that way. That's what I think. Yeah. And so I guess, I guess my question, I guess my question is after that, right? It's, it's kind of making that turn. You know, it wasn't, you know, what's the big deal if America drops to two? It's more given that even if America drops to two, as you said, it can functionally act as though it's still number one. Um, it's, it's, it's the question then becomes, well, what does that mean for your vision of how we move forward of being able to um, construct these sort of cultural narratives that might change how it is we understand ourselves, given that it will be very easy to understand ourselves as we have for like, you know, like the last, you know, couple of decades. Yeah, but I think, I mean, here's where thinking more globally and in a, about a multipolar um, challenge to American exceptionalism becomes the crucial, uh, you know, question, the cultural matrix that people like you and I are going to operate within when we, when we do our research, when we teach our students, when we, when we think about our place as kind of historians and students of American culture. And that is, <clears throat> I don't think we can predict what it'll look like in 10 or 20 years, but I do think we can predict that, it, that American exceptionalism can't sputter on in the way that it has. And that it will have to change. And I, and I guess what I, what I think is there are already signs that the culture's organizing myths have begun to change, like superhero franchise movies. I mean, it's not just that there, there are black superhero films and Asian superhero films now. It, it's that all the genres that are the kind of, let's say, the Hollywood mythologies of America are being rescripted slowly to confront a different kind of reality. So in, in the book, I talk about space movies, for example. You know, what's different about space movies now than 30 years ago in the heroic phase of the Apollo flights? One, they're almost all anti-heroic. Two, they recognize and confront the reality of a multipolar world so that, um, you know, the, the subplot of cooperation in space with the Chinese, for example, has become like a dominant trope of more contemporary space films. And, you know, if you think, if you switch gears from Hollywood to serial TV, which is like for a lot of audiences, you know, quality TV or serial TV is a kind of dominant meeting place for the culture. So much of that, um, as my friend and colleague, Michael Zale has, has written about and is about to publish a book about, so much of that is dominated by the idea of a kind of re-scripting of the family business into a criminal enterprise and that, which used to be a subgenre of American culture, right? The, the gangster film, the mafia film, or the organized crime film. It's now, it's a, it's a, it's a suburban um, kind of everywhere family genre, which is the idea that hyper-capitalism is actually to some degree criminal and crony capitalism. And that absolutely unrestricted free markets are actually the site of really serious immoral and amoral wrongdoing. That's so dominant now in the culture that I think it, it begins to mark for me a really important shift. And, and I think the two most important factors in the shift are racial struggle, the struggle for racial justice in the country, and climate change. And they both represent a direct challenge to the idea that growth is the solution to profound problems of social justice. 
I just think fewer and fewer Americans of your generation or mine believe we can use growth to solve those problems because we can't. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think whew, those are those are big issues full of a bunch of contradictory discourses. And I was surprised at that turn you took there of how you read serial TV. And it's I mean, I do see the family criminal enterprise thing, but I was surprised you read this as a, as a kind of criticism of, of hyper capitalism. You know what I see going on right now in the culture is this really weird sort of love of like corporatized revolution, right? And so even the two struggles you named don't require anything of anybody. I mean, if we believe Adolf Reed, you know, there isn't a working class struggle to speak of in this country. There is no egalitarian movement. It has been sufficiently snuffed out. And that's a whole long sort of line of argument. But it, it, it does seem to me to to, to raise the question of, 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 of okay, and, and we're getting into it, we're making a pivot, because um, you do identify culture as this sort of really important side of contestation where the sort of rewriting of American myths could happen. And I just had so many questions about that, because you also, um, and we can talk about the, the importance of the new left from the UK, the new left scholars, but I was so curious about that, just because, you know, we're in a bad place right now in the US in terms of literacy of any kind, right, before we get to historical literacy or critical literacy. I mean, people just can't read, right, if we're thinking about through K through 12, if we're thinking about adults, you know, I saw online um, uh, from a reputable source, right, that, you know, 50% of adults can't read past an eighth grade level. Um, And so when we talk about, okay, we need to redefine myths, I was very curious about how you saw that happening happening. And you just sort of named two sites, right? Uh, Hollywood, serial TV, but those, both of those seem bound up with global capital in a way that seems sort of invested in narratives of supremacy. Ones that aren't necessarily, I think, tied only or um, narrowly to, to racial identity or white supremacy. Um, so I was curious about that. Like, okay, so academics are going to play a role. How, what's the mechanism, mechanism of dissemination? What do we think that means in a country where I do think we're going to get dumber, right? For just to put it crudely, I mean, it's already happening. I mean, you've been a college professor for a very long time, so you can measure it, you know, across your career. But it's true. It's true. And yet, uh, there are ways people get smarter as they get dumber, you know, um, and my students, uh, I think, really know things that, that I didn't know um, about culture and certainly about digital culture, for example. Um, I mean, I, I guess I believe and, uh, you know, I feel like I'm now advancing possibly a willfully naive form of argumentation with the specific problem of literacy and education that you're talking about. But I'll, I'll try to pivot back to pop culture since, as you said, we're, we're, in, we're in both territories now and they're related, but they're distinct. But the educational belief. I mean, I think when you engage students through the discipline of history and the disciplines of history, of which our branch of cultural and literary history is an important one and importantly oriented towards historical thinking, that's the kind of literacy we most need our students to have. Um, even beyond a certain kind of aesthetic you know, or critical training that we have and that we try to share with our students, that, those kinds of historical literacy and civic literacy I think when students sense, even students who don't have a great deal of critical thinking training or a great deal of, you know, literacy resources to think this way, they sense truth and lie. I mean, this is what young people, whether they're three or 23, understand, which is they understand bullshit slash mythology slash ideology. And I think if we actually fight these history wars in the school boards of every small town of Virginia and we struggle as we have to and as we are currently against the kind of whitewashing, the panicked whitewashing, re-whitewashing of American history into the idea that, you know, that we weren't a flawed country, that there wasn't a kind of settler genocide at the core of our founding, etc. If, if, we, if we can actually, in, in the trenches, continue to show that what counts at school is not just rote ideas someone wants you to learn so you can get a job, but a struggle over the meaning of what it is to be a citizen of this country and a member of this society. I think that's galvanizing. I think that mission, you know, pessimistic as I am about the loss of literacy and about the kind of right-wing takeover of the capillary network of American politics and culture, I think it's I think it's motivating and galvanizing to a lot of people. I think in the 
long run, and this is why I think in terms of these hundred years history of British hundred year histories of British and American power, I think in the long run that we're living through a very intense backlash phase right now. And I don't subscribe to the pessimistic notion that the forces of right wing authoritarian populism have taken over our country. They're rooted very deeply, very powerfully, and unrooting them will be the work of generations. But it's work and it's happening and a lot of us are involved in it. And then, you know, your other question rooted through multinational corporate control of our of our popular culture. I mean, yes, you're right, but here we go to the mystery of all culture, right? That you must think about all the time. And I know I do, which is all culture is official culture in some sense, if it's got money behind it. You know, so where does dissidence or resistance or symbolic alternative come from? Sometimes it comes from within the belly of the beast. Sometimes corporate control doesn't mean they control the way messages are processed and interpreted and received. And I, I, I mean, I do think that movies and TV have to generate critical contradictions or people don't find them interesting. And when those critical contradictions are generated, even if the movie believes it has sealed them up and recontained them symbolically at the end and pleased the audience and played into the least critical thinking impulses that the audience has, even when they believe that that's true, it's not. And, and that, you know, that's, this is real, like, a product of my training through kind of 1970s and 80s British New Left thinking, a very core idea that Stuart Hall is associated with in his essay, Encoding, Decoding, right? Which is that the decoding matters. Whatever messages are coded into high and low literature, popular and canonical culture, they can be coded, decoded differently. Yeah, so just quickly on this, and then I do I do want to move, um, but... You know, I mean, I guess, I guess to that, I mean, I'm not a pessimist either, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not someone who buys narratives of right wing populism and its takeover either. But that's these are all really complicated conversations. You wrote a very short book, and so we don't have to dig into those. Um, but I am sort of curious about this, so I'll give an example of why I'm a little suspicious of sort of official culture and you know, all all cultures official culture, but messages matter. I mean, messages do matter, but eventually after hearing a message, you got to go out and do stuff, right? It's like eventually you have to engage in the kind of egalitarian struggle that so far, you know, Americans have resisted for, for, for much of our history. Um, but, you know, an example that I have is, is, is like Squid Game, right? Like, which has a message, sure. But like the reality is like people didn't like the message because it's like rich people are bad. People like the message. I mean, the reason why it was such a such a phenomenon was because because of the violence, this spectacle of violence. Like, I mean, that's kind of it. I mean, I think it was like the collision of the spectacle of violence and sort of, you know, it having this sort of veneer of having a, a kind of radical message. But that's exactly my point. Right. Is that so much of our culture does sort of both things at the same time. Right. Where it's it's saying like this is bad, but it also celebrates it. Right. And so irony has become not only a kind of the language of our culture, but also a, a way to sort of sustain delusions. Um, and so I'm thinking about students who come to class and, and maybe they have some critiques of, of, of the world. But for the most part, they are they bought into a social media that has sort of made it easy to seem like a dissident in a way that's nevertheless conformist without actually knowing anything. Don't you, so, sense, don't you sense underneath that a hunger for some deeper form of action and engagement? Not. You don't. I sense, I sense a hunger for belonging, but I rarely sense a, 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 whenever I try to talk to students about, you know, the realities of what it would take to solve even a basic social problem, like say, let's just say the racial education gap. They don't want to think about the realities of what it would look like. The fact that if we really, as a country, were to devote our resources to it, it would still probably take a couple of decades. And then even there, we might not be successful, right? I mean, I think students fundamentally often in my courses don't understand the true nature of problems as they're lived and experienced by actual people. They're just kind of like metaphors or something for their own ways that they're unhappy with themselves. And so if you're black, then all your problems are because you're black. If you're, you know, whatever. Yeah. And that becomes a way well, of just really now, kind of. And now if you're yeah. white, it's because all your problems are because you're white. That's the crazy part of where we are now. I mean, that's was... right. Well, that's the thing. And to me, this is just this is this is sort of social justice as entertainment. Right. Because where a lot of these discussions are happening is on social media. And so so I do have a bit of a, 
some skepticism there uh, about the sort of messaging matter. And at the, at the end of the day, we all got to sit in a room, figure out what we need to do, figure out how we're going to do it with the resources that are available to us. And those conversations to me seem further from us than they've ever been. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple, I, I, I think you're making very powerful points and I, and I, and I worry about them. And I'll just say one thing quickly about squid game, which is insane. And maybe you saw this, which is like, <laughs> did you it. see, did you see that, um, uh, there's some kind of production company that's, that's mounting an American version of squid game and that they were even doing a publicity stunt of having an actual contest. Did you see this? And I was, I saw this online and I'm pretty sure it's true. And I was like, Oh my God, they have not grasped the idea that this was like a Darwinian death cult. You know, they think it's like a fun contest, like Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory, golden ticket time. So I mean, the depth of ideological blindness about what Squid Game's message about competition and capitalism was really supports your point. On the other hand, I do I think that it's possible to understand Squid Game as a like as a trend phenomenon without understanding that people have always been attracted to this Robin Hood concept. No. And your point is, yes, they like the concept. It's a story. They don't like to convert that into actual socialism or rearrangement of property and distribution of resources in our society. They like to fantasize that, but they don't like to do it. And at a certain point, the fantasy is almost a distraction from the action. So that is a very powerful critique. But I have two things to say about education. One is, you know, you and I, I think because we're both working to earn a salary as college professors, we spend a lot of time with people at exactly the wrong age in a sense. I mean, when I'm talking about young people understand bullshit, I mean, six-year-olds understand bullshit, not just 20-year-olds. And, you know, K through 12 education is where the history war is really being played out. We still have some freedom in our classrooms, but our friends and colleagues who teach in K through 12 systems that are coming under ideological control from a right-wing you know, counter revolution of ideas, they're under real constraint. And that that's a serious problem. But I still think, on the other hand, what you said about social media, and, and, you know, sort of radical chic, and the fact that people can entertain ideas about changing American society, but they can't act on them. Um, I think, if you spend time, as you probably have, and I have teaching or working with 50, 60, 70 year old people, there's a depth there that 20 year olds don't have. And people become less captivated by social media and by the American rhetoric of success and by the relentlessly amoral pragmatism of, of our society's, you know, capture by market fundamentalism and by toxic individualism. Those to me are the two really hardest to uproot ideologies at the core of American life, toxic individualism and market fundamentalism. And, and the reason I circle back over those terms in response to the meditation you were just doing is, you know, my, my particular scholarly life and the research that I did in my 20s and 30s to try to understand British culture, it was kind of a distraction for me from real problems of America that I considered depressing and unsolvable. And some of those had to do with class and race. But now I look at it and I think, you know, people absorbed ideas in, in the formation of American culture over the 200 years, you know, before this century. <clears throat> and a big source of the ideas that we, that, that went into forming American civic and popular and political culture was Britain. And there was a kind of ideological attachment in, the, in 19th century Britain to radical individualist constructions of society. We call them liberal theory of the liberal subject, essentially, and, and to market fundamentalism or free trade, laissez-faire capitalism. And those sets of ideas, I think, are deeply woven in to all of our popular culture. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm writing about in my current research as a kind of part two of this book that you and I are talking about, which is how all the genres of detective fiction, science fiction, historical romance, um, espionage, um, you name it, alien invasion fiction, they all sort of turn on an anti-state way of thinking and an anti-collective way of thinking. 
And I guess what I'm saying to you in response to your very powerful challenge about whether ideas can ever become action is let's find out. Let's see when the scripts start to change. And I think they're already changing. Let's see if it disrupts people's reflex notions of American greatness, of the power of individuals rather than collectives and states, and about the power of markets rather than social and civic values that curb, regulate, and counter market fundamentalism. I think there's a possibility there. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess I will say, you know, to me, the scripts, the way I see the scripts changing and the kind of macroys that you might point to, the history wars, um, all the sort of culture wars in K through 12 schools, it seems to me like those ways are still bound up though with market capitalism and toxic individual. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're not separate from them and they often are instantiations of them, especially in how they're sort of carried out, even the wars themselves. And so that's why I have, I, I guess I have, uh, you know, a, a bit of skepticism, but I think a better um, example would be very quickly. And then we do have other questions, so we don't get bogged down in talking about movies. Um, but I want you, you've probably seen sorry to bother you, right? It's a film that frustrates me to no end, right? Because it's basically about, you know, poor guy wants to move up in life. We get that, does, figures out he's selling slaves, you know, to really rich people. And it's like, oh, that's terrible. But still doesn't quit his job at that point, right? Doesn't quit his job until he realizes that, no, they turn human beings into horses. And so even the film itself sort of cast doubt on the ability for us to actually engage in any kind of struggle, any kind of class struggle, Right. And at the end of the film, it turns into a farce. It turns into a farce. Right. Like at the end, you know, after we've watched this film where we've gotten to be like, yes, capitalism, bad capitalism's wrong. Even the protagonist in that film isn't moved by the by the horror of capitalism. He's not even he you know, he just kind of absents himself, goes back to his garage. And then at the end, he becomes a horse. And so the entire movie, whatever critique it would try to put forward, has been undermined that it, it becomes the very thing it's protesting a kind of spectacle where you get to enjoy the critique, but also it kind of gets deflated almost at the end into kind of farce. It's like at the protest when you got hit with the can and then they had the wig of the getting hit in a can, head with a can at a protest. It's like exactly that happens in the diegetic unfolding of the film itself. And so that's an example to me of where, it, 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 yeah, anywhere where I locate protest in popular culture, it's always somehow deflated. <laughs> And people never critique that film, but it's such an incoherent film if you think about it on an ideological level as something that's supposed to be arguing about how social change actually could happen. It has no faith in that. Yeah, actually. And, I, and I think similar arguments can be made about Jordan Peele's two super successful like genre films. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess l- let me tell you how I think about that and ask you how you think about it, because like... I feel like something very profoundly limiting happened in the 1980s in America and that the right succeeded so powerfully in the Reagan era at shifting the conversation so that only social solutions that could take place within a certain kind of market capitalism could be entertained as at all real or reasonable. And that's essentially what produced the Clinton version of the Democratic Party. And we're still living through that essentially, even through Obama, even through Biden. And so there isn't a real alternative to the idea that market solutions are social solutions. On the other hand, I do think when I go back further into culture, into the 60s and 70s, for example, which I think are the really important pivot decades in American history, I think there was a way of thinking about the limits of growth and the limits of capitalism and the symbolic limits of capitalism. And I think there are, you know, I'm going to have trouble coming up with as, as succinct an example as you just did um, with Sorry to Bother You. But I mean, I think there are sources of protest and sources of meaning that were even in the mainstream culture in the 60s and 70s that hadn't yet capitulated to the idea that capitalism is the final horizon of all human problem solving. And I guess my point about climate change and about all the other signs and symptomatologies of American decline is that in in the end, if the American capitalist machine slows down to a point where people see it as not inevitably going to get bigger, better, stronger, um, and greater, that is the one thread I think we can tug on that 80s lockbox of thinking. And when we pull that thread, 
maybe we have a chance to get ourselves and our students thinking outside, you know, growth capitalism. And, and I don't know if you, if you fastened onto the parts of my book where I very briefly talk about the degrowth movement in economics. Um, but I know that many, many students, even students who are inside the kind of elite success culture of our higher education apparatus, many, many students, I think, feel that that is exactly the economics of the future, right? Which is, which is that sustainability is more, is absolutely necessary. And, and the club for growth and the cult of growth has to be over now. And if that changes the profession of economics, I think that changes the world. I really do. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I guess, I guess my question would be, you know, is it possible that well, I have two questions and then this will help us move because <laughs> we, you know, I know we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time here. These are um, great issues you're bringing up though. So but, I'm okay with it, but yeah, move where you want to move. Well, is it possible that as, you know, capitalism slows down in the U S it becomes more rapacious? Like, you know, I mean, it becomes more, um, gosh, um, uh, um, uh, I don't even know the word, but more encompassing and its surveillance of its own citizens, um, which is where I kind of see it going. Um, and I, I wonder what that means. Um, but then I also had a question that's sort of related to the timeline you gave. Um, one of the things that I was interested in your book, and this will get us somewhere else, is um, that you, you, you link declinism as being sort of, you say declinism is linked to a felt sense of lost national greatness. But you say that that, that that sense is felt across racial lines, class lines, gender lines, you know, what have you. And so you, you, you do a really sort of great job of identifying what a response to that looks like on the right, right? Engaging in various kinds of nostalgia, sometimes nativist, sometimes racist, whatever. I'm curious if it has, if it looks a certain way on the left, if the left doesn't also engage in various kinds of nostalgia. Um, and like navel gazing and like just sort of weird impotent behaviors that are about sort of that are avoidant, but that are, yeah, I'll just, yeah. yeah. Well, I might've just been my own symptom in answer to your question by being like, Hey, remember the sixties and seventies, Brittany there, we could think outside capitalism then. I mean, maybe that is an avoidant form of nostalgia. Um, or even the one that people usually do is like unions, right? So like popular front type stuff, right? They're like, oh, we could get back there. It's like, we can't get, we can't get back there. Right. It's, it's either back to the 30s. Like. It's like back to the 30s or it's back to the 60s, you know, or it's back to the Obama era, like any of those forms of nostalgia. Um, I, I agree very wholeheartedly with you that that is symptomatic of a frustrated and a thwarted and a disempowered left and a de-energized left. Um I guess my, I mean, we're, we're, we're fielding really big problems, like how to fix America. And I know, I know you know that, and, and that it's hard for either of us with our own views on the world to, to grapple with problems at that scale. But I, I, I guess I can scale it down to something specific in our conversation today, pivoting off the work I did for this book. And that is, yes, there's a specific problem there's a specific form that the problem of decline takes, not just on the right, but on the left. And even more specifically, I think the problem takes the form of a contradiction between the mainstream liberal democratic Joe Biden Democratic Party version of the left, if you want to call it that, really the center, um, and the progressive left, the cultural left, and, and the worlds that you and I travel in a lot, right, um, academic versions of, of the left, um, and the problem is the contradiction, which is one side is so thoroughly steeped in the critique of American exceptionalism and aware of the toxicity of official patriotism and even of older flavors of nationalism, that it disavows the idea of national attachment altogether because it's, it's so thoroughly corrupted by history and by ideology. And then the other version of the left, which is to say the Biden, Obama, Hillary Clinton version in order to keep a certain kind of moderate white voters in the party has to speak a very traditionalist Eisenhower era version of American patriotism, which is the greatness discourse that I've invoked a bunch of times today. And that's a really radical split and a contradiction between two groups that need to be in alliance and coalition to survive this Trumpist era that we're in right now. And so I, I direct the book at those two audiences and, and attempting to create a left liberal, um, I, I guess, miniature coalition, let's say, around this one simple concept, which is that the, 
the further progressive wing has to realize that you can't disdain nationalism altogether. The, the gut attachments of too many Americans, people who count, people who matter, even if we disagree with them, even if they're toxic, um, is to a kind of construction of the nation. And the center, the mainstream liberals, are so reflexively wedded to recycling this very outdated, generationally stale version of patriotism. It, it's, like, it's like a mantra to them, and they have to stop saying it, is my point. And if those two things can happen, which is to say the, far, the farther left can stop disdaining patriotism and the center left can stop remanufacturing the mythology of greatness, then there's a language, then there's a possible language of emergence on the left, which is organized around what I would call, you know, democratic socialist concepts and values that will genuinely appeal to non-elites of many kinds in this country. Yeah, man. I mean, I really like that uh, discussion of your book, even though, you know, as you're talking, I wonder why you would li limit any coalition building to only sort of left liberal people, but anybody who you, you could kind of pull in, especially if it's like a sort of social democratic ethos that's behind it. But I want to ask, I have three questions. So I want us to get them all in. And uh, the first is just kind of like, well, how do you parse nostalgia for a prior period of U.S. supremacy, right? So superiorist rhetoric or supremacist rhetoric, how do you parse that and a desire for a quality of life that was available to more Americans just a decade ago, right? If I'm a normal, I'm, I'm an average American, you know, just a decade ago, um, you know, we weren't dealing with what we're dealing with now, which rising costs of living, rising crime, poor edu educational outcomes in K through 12, stagnant wages. I mean, we could go on down the list, rising healthcare costs. So just even in a decade within this sort of period of decline, you know, how is it that in sort of rhetoric that you see, you know, from, from people on the ground, from U.S. citizens, from politicians, how is it that you parse the, the difference between that nostalgia and just also just like a desire for a quality of life that folks really did have just 10 years ago? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'll answer the question, but I, I do think the premise of the question should be broadened. Uh, from my point of view, it's you know, it's been 50 years of stagnant wage growth, 50 years of frozen household income, which is especially stark and bleak coming on top of 30 years of unprecedented growth in family income and, um, and wage rates and, and distribution of income and progressive taxation. So the 50s through the 70s was a unusually buoyant, prosperous, and economically democratic time um, by comparison to any previous phase of U.S. history and any subsequent phase of U.S. history. And people are still living for that imagined version of American capitalism and American democracy. And it died a long time ago, two generations ago. And for me, the link piece that, that answers your question about how to parse it is, the linking piece is, the Reagan to Trump arc is an arc defined by precisely the, the frozen and stagnant growth of lower and middle class incomes and and the the plateaued or in some in some important ways declining you know li life styles of most Americans over that period of time combined with the fantastic absurd obscene exponential expansion of wealth in the top 5 or 10%. How does that have to do with the book on national decline and and the cultural and rhetorical rhetorical sides of national decline? Well, it was Reagan who first said, let's make America great again. It was Trump who repeated it. Margaret Thatcher did the same thing on the other side of the Atlantic. These are all heavily austerity-driven right-wing economic thinkers who basically tried to funnel the ordinary natural political desires of the American non-elite American people for a better life into a fantasy construction a national projection of the idea that America was a once and future great power and that Britain was a once and future great power. And it's the scarcity and austerity thinking that produced the dismantling of the welfare state and regressive taxation, massively regressive taxation, pa practically no corporate tax, no environmental tax in America. It was a massively successful campaign to change the economics wiring and infrastructure of the federal government um, all driven by what is, this is the important part, by what is a symbolic and mythological attachment to the rhetoric of greatness, to 
re- disconnect the American people from their ordinary wishes for a decent life and reconnect them to a fantasy version of a country that was once great and could be great again, when that greatness doesn't do anything for people. It doesn't actually do anything for people. Yeah, you know, I hear you. I just, I guess I'm just thinking about the voter. Like if someone tells me, hey, like, you know, I want to make it so like, li- like, you know, rent is less. I, I, that's where I start wondering like how we parse this, right? So so politicians are politicianing, but if I'm on the ground just trying to, you know, I'm a normal person, maybe I'm in that 50% that can't read above an eighth grade level. I want somebody to tell me, look, like I, I I can put food on the table. I can save a little bit of money. And so that's what I'm, I'm curious about in the actual sort of play of culture and politics, how we distinguish, especially amongst the folks who are sort of, I guess, most susceptible to these myths, how we distinguish between, you know, um, I guess, sort of a deep investment in supremacy and maybe just an investment in like, life is hell right now in America for most people, um, for a great many people. Yeah, well, I mean, it's because the rhetoric of supremacy sustains, for example, the incredibly outsized military spending. If we weren't invested in in um, that kind of superiority, you know, what would, what kinds of resources would be loosened up to try to solve ordinary social problems? Well, your reaction to that suggests that you think that that's a quixotic mission, or no, well, it's just funny because on Twitter there was this Gallup poll going around where it was showing like the loss of the, the American loss of confidence in, in American institutions, and every single one was below fifty percent, I think, except the military and small businesses. Like that remained unchanged um, between twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, but every single other one was below fifty percent, um, like and like significantly below, like in the thirties. Um, 30%. And so, you know, it's weird. It's like, well, that's the only thing Americans believe in. <laughs> yeah. I, right. Small business. The I mean, that is the Reagan, <laughs> I mean, that's the Reagan magic right there. The eighties became about the entrepreneur and the military. And, you know, this is between the tech bros on the West coast and the generals on the East coast, you know, that's where people think America is going to be saved. And that is precisely what I'm saying you know, in response to all your questions and your really probing read of America today is that's the military industrial complex. The tech bros on the West Coast and the generals on the East Coast in the Pentagon, that's basically the Eisenhower version of what's going to save this country, which is we outproduce and we outmuscle militarily everybody else. And somehow that solves social problems. And I'm saying, you know, as people who work in culture and education and media, we can't fix everything, but we can start to persuade the people we can start to persuade our students, our listeners, our, our friends, our colleagues, our institutional leaders, you know, that, that, that deeply and fundamentally conservative idea that our society will be saved by going back to what America was rather than forward to what it could be. Just that alone is, is the beginning of an improvement in the, cultural climate around which social problems are solved. And it is only a beginning. I mean, that's what your questions have been pointing to. It's but a beginning, but it's an important one. And it's one that I don't think a lot of Americans of any educational level spend a lot of time thinking, hey, how did Britain survive their loss of power? And that's why I wrote this book short and, and you know, attempting to be as lucid as it could be on that problem, because I think the British blew it. And if you look at what's going on with Boris Johnson today, you see a country that's absolutely been flailing in and through the Brexit crisis and in a way flailing for 30 or 40 years since Thatcher. But as I say in the book, when they lost a lot of their global power, the daily lives of the people, the stuff you're talking about, rent, cost of commuting, cost of healthcare, actually got better for more people in Britain. Being number two and then number three and then number six was actually in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a good thing for most British people. Yes, there were elites who were deeply invested in the idea of British superiority who were panicked, as our elites are. But for a lot of people, being a less powerful country made for a better life. Yeah, I mean, you went where I wanted to go um, to close because I really liked your phrase, you know, sort of revival through contraction. And so I wonder if you could just, maybe we could end with you telling us about 
you know, the way that the U.S. could not become the U.K. as it becomes number two. And you've already said some things, but you might add on just thinking through, you know, what we might learn from, you know, the new left scholars in the U.K., from the U.K.'s own failure, um, what pitfalls there might be. Yeah, well, we've touched on two key things. One is <clears throat> just the facts. And the facts are, I think you're absolutely right about something that I would want to highlight from our conversation. And that is, as I mentioned a few times in the book, too, Entities of power are dangerous when they're on top, maybe even more dangerous when they're falling down the other side of the mountain, when they're shrinking, when they're embattled, when they're panicked. So there's every reason to be alarmed about what's going to happen next in America, every reason. On the other hand, compared to Britain, which was a tiny country that projected global power through an enormous, enormously expanded network of commercial, economic, and naval control in the 19th century, America is positioned territorially and demographically, and it's still a net immigrating country, as you pointed out, to actually be very prosperous in the period of our number two-ness, you know, and to, and to have enough social resources, if they could be better distributed, to prevent a kind of austerity panic setting in in the 2020s and the 2030s. Um, you know, banning some profound and possible climate crisis ahead if we can defossilize the economy and we can hold back together the political culture that's been fragmenting, then I think, you know, America stands to be materially much better off than Britain was even in those decades I just mentioned, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when, when the welfare state actually redistributed resources and made life better for a lot of British people. Okay. And then there's the second part. And that is how do we avoid that fracturing, that obvious fissuring, the deep polarization of our society? And it's not just political parties, it's people, you know, it's people. Um, and that's where I think the lesson of the British New Left is so important. And this will be me repeating something that you drew out from my reflections on the book a little while ago. And that is the New Left historians had a very deep criticism of the authoritarian and right wing rhetoric of white populism in Britain in the 50s, 60s, 70s, leading up to Thatcher. And boy, they were right about how toxic that could be once it took the institutional form of Thatcherism, as it is toxic in the institutional form of Trumpism. But what they didn't do is what so many left cultural critics do, and that is that profound condescension to people of all kinds who are poorly trained, poorly educated, who who have become attached to forms of thinking about America that are toxic, but, but not because their own desires or their own persons are toxic, but because you know the structures and the ideologies that surround them and that are fed to them are toxic. And I just feel like what the, what the British New Left was saying was the, the, the social contradictions that are driving people to be attached to white populism are real and profoundly painful and disruptive to people. We have to solve those problems. We can't just convince them that like racism is a bad idea. We have to solve the problems of their lives materially, you know, and we have to take their desires seriously. We have to not treat them like they are poisoned people, but rather people who've been fed bad ideas and who could be fed better ideas and whose lives could be improved by a more sane and humane version of the state. I think that's a, a great note to, to end on. So thank you so much for this interview. Thank you. That was great. I really found it, um, you know, bracing to think it all back through with you. So really appreciate your, your reading and, and your questions. <laughs>